Hello, my name is Marianne Rockwell. I'm a librarian at Saratoga Springs Public Library. And this is Poets Talk Poetry. This morning, I will be speaking with Jackie Craven, a poet uh, who runs the open mic in Schenectady. And she can talk more about that. And I've invited her to read a poem that she admires by another poet and one of her own poems. Um, and so more about Jackie. Her most recent poems can be found in Agni Journal, Chautauqua Journal, the Ma Massachusetts Review and other distinguished journals. She's the author of a chapbook of fabulous fictions, Our Lives Became Unmanageable, and the poetry collection, Secret Formulas and Techniques of the Masters. The latter book includes surreal takes on growing up in Virginia in a family of painters. After completing a doctorate of arts in writing from the University of Albany, New York, Jackie worked for many years as a journalist writing about architecture, visual art, literature, and cultural travel. She lives in Schenectady where she hosts the second Wednesday open mic now held on Zoom. Hello, Jackie. Thank you Hello. for coming on to Poets Talk Poetry. Thanks for having me. So the first poem that you're going to read is um, Two Monkeys by Bruegel by Wislasa, Wislasa Zimborska. That's my best take on the pronunciation of her name. Um, and it's an ekphrastic poem. And you also write ekphrastic poems, especially in the the aforementioned book, Secret Formulas and Techniques of the Masters. Um, and you, so ekphrastic poetry, and you can expand on this, my interpretation is um, poetry that responds to art. It doesn't have to be a painting or a sculpture, visual art, it could be a piece of music, but we most often think of it as responding to visual art. Um, so first I want to share uh, Bruegel's Two Monkeys, um, for us to contemplate for a moment. So it's it's a tiny, tiny um, canvas. It's it's about the size of a paperback novel, um, and it was painted in the mid. 1500s. The scene in the background is is a prosperous port, uh, Flemish port, and um, you see two monkeys. They're sitting in a windowsill. They're chained. Uh, one looks out at the the port, and the other seems to be looking into the room. Um, so there, there are many theories about what. Borgo intended when he painted this, but most certainly he meant the image to be symbolic. Um, some say he was uh, making a statement about the rise of capitalism and how um, the um, prosperous people actually can become slave, enslaved by their own um, profit motives. Another theory is that he was responding to um, the, the uh, invasion um, in, by the Spanish into, um, into the Flemish city. Um, but more generally, he seemed to be saying something about um, the humanity and enslavement. Uh, so this is the painting that... Um, was Lawa Simborski was responding to when she wrote her poem, uh, Two Monkeys by Bruegel. Okay, so why don't we hear the poem now? All right. Uh, and I, th there are many translations of this poem and they're all marvelous, uh, but the translation I'm reading is by uh, Stanislav Barnaszek and Claire Kavanaugh. And this is in a, uh, collection of Simborski's poems. It was published in about 2015. It, the collection is called Map Collected in Last Poems. 
uh, Two Monkeys by Bruegel. This is what I see in my dreams about final exams. Two monkeys chained to the floor, sit on the windowsill. The sky behind them flutters. The sea is taking its bath. The exam is history of mankind. I stammer and hedge. One monkey stares and listens with mocking disdain. The other seems to be dreaming away. But when it's clear I don't know what to say, he prompts me with a gentle clinking of his chain. Thank you. So I could read this poem just so many times and think something different about it each time. It's rather mysterious, like the, the painting. So tell me. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it, it begins, it, it sets a dream, almost a, a nightmare scene. And haven't we all had this nightmare sitting in, a, in an exam and we don't know the answers to the questions? It, it, it's kind of a universal nightmare. So it begins in a surreal, uh, setting a surreal dreamy scene. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because it seems like the painting juxtaposes, um, you know, lofty aspirations with a beautiful landscape in the background to these two monkeys who are looking down and, and, um, and chained. Um, and yet the monkey at the end is the one who has the answer to passing her exams, the one who is mm -hmm. chained and doesn't speak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The wonderful thing about uh, Zimborska's monkey is that it's, it's both um, mocking but tender. And, and her work is known for that kind of dichotomy. You, you have playfulness and pain, the juxtaposition of, of seemingly opposing feelings. There's wonderful tenderness to this monkey that even though it's mocking, it's a gentle clinking of the chain. And I love the sound mm -hmm. there, the reference to the, the sound. Um, th this monkey takes on a superior parent parental or teacherly attitude. Uh -huh. You know, the monkey's in chains, but really the monkey knows better. Right. The monkey is somehow not confined by the chains. Mm -hmm. And it's, and so gentle clinking of it, that's definitely oxymoronic, two opposite um, words there. And the chain, what do you think? Th there's something interesting about chain too, we could unpack. Well, I, it, it, it references the, the enslavement of, of, um, of humanity uh, and not necessarily literal enslavement, but the things that, that bind us, that hold us down, that, that uh, make it impossible for us to live freely. Um, and there, yeah, like you say, there's so many interpretations of this poem. I mean, um, it, it can talk uh, more generally about what happens to humanity over and over again um, without resolution. Um, it, it can talk about um, more specifically the background uh, that, that the poem was written in. She, she wrote this in the mid um, 50s in, and when she had lived during the time of the Nazis and then um, there was the rise of socialism. Um, so her more recent historic background Mm -hmm. be a factor in this. And then uh, you could also see it as a reference to um, language. Um, the narrator stammers and hedges. Um, and you have a, a Tower of Babel feeling that, that the, the difficulty, impossibility of communication mm -hmm. um, of understanding each other. So uh, the poem could be referencing that also. Mm -hmm. 
And it's also kind of a tribute to painting because painting is an art form that doesn't require words, doesn't require um, mm -hmm. um, language to move us. Yes, although it's interesting that um, if you look closely at the painting, she isn't literally reproducing, describing exactly no. what's in the painting. And that's the way it is in plastic poetry. Usually the, the, the artwork is the initial inspiration, but the, the writer can go off with her own vision. Mm. Um, I'm not sure the monkey in the painting has an expression of uh, one dozing and the other mocking. They look more humped and oppressed uh -huh. than that. I, I think um, Zimborska was layering on her own ideas exactly. onto this painting. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And then the, what's in the first stanza, I just wanted to mention the kind of curious description of the sky and sea. Um, the sky behind them flutters. The sea is taking its bath. So it's like a very reductive human perception of um, this massive, you know, this cosmic cosmos that we live in, the sky and the sea, you know, are just infinite. And we're reducing them to uh, something that flutters a flag or a sail, uh, something to take a bath in. You know? So, um, and I yeah. think she's mocking, she's mocking that, that human tendency perhaps to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's it, at the same time, it's so wonderfully playful. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it does, I, in, in the exam is history of mankind. I stammer and hedge. I mean, you have this enormity, history of mankind, and then me, my problem. <laughs> um, it, the, the comparison of the enormous and the minute. Um, but m most of all, I, I really enjoy the way she can capture pain with such playfulness and such tenderness. And I, and I think that's a characteristic that, that runs through many of her poems. And it's also maybe why we turn to poetry because we, we need a way to cope with things that are painful. And she mm -hmm. helps us in that way, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, great. So shall we move on to um, the next painting and the next poem? And right now I'm going to share your mother's painting Louise Craven Horig is your mom's name. Did I say her name correctly? Oregon. Oregon. Okay. Louise Craven Horrigan um, painted this Lobsters for Lunch. Would you talk about the painting? Yeah. Uh, late in her life, my, my mother moved from realism to this, this kind of... Um, primitivism uh, that was seeped in, in, in story. She, she, I'm certain that she was familiar with the Bruegel painting and actually monkeys are a recurring trope in her paintings. She often inserted a monkey. Um, and uh, when I was cleaning out her condo after she died, I um, was going through these paintings that I had never really looked closely at before, but now trying to understand her and her life, I started to examine the details and I was amazed at how many stories I could get from a single image. I mean, you had the couple, you had the, the enormous lobster, you have these uh, mole prints hanging on the line. You have the, the crane holding a fish. You have the man with the camera photographing all of this, which suggests, underlines, underscores the feeling of artifice. I mean, this is a painting about artifice. Mm -hmm. um, this, this scene is rather like a postcard. It's somehow artificial uh, and the monkey the interesting thing about the monkey, which is the same monkey that appears in many of her paintings, uh, the facial expression reminded me of my mother. Mm -hmm. um, the eyes, especially, maybe it's not so visible in this 
particular one, but when you see a picture of the monkey facing the front, the eyes are very like her eyes. And I started to see the monkey as, as um, kind of a persona uh, that she inserted into the paintings. And the interesting thing about this monkey is it's trying to drink from an empty glass and it has a banana in its hand, but it's just kind of a floppy banana. Um, and the monkey isn't trying to eat the banana. It's just kind of flopped there. So the painting seems to show all these wonderful things, but they're somehow not real. And the people are not, for some reason, the people are not partaking. You know, the, the enormous lobster, the pineapple, um, the mangoes, but people aren't eating. And the glass of water, but the monkey can't drink. The monkey, but the, 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 the banana, but the monkey isn't eating. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if you look at these little uh, prints hanging on the line, even those uh, each have their own little story uh, within them. Uh, mm -hmm. So, when I was writing the poem and really started out as a journal entry, trying to unravel stories of my mother's life, I mean, it went on and on and on and on and on. I could, I could write so much about this one thing. Right. And the thing about ecrastic art is that um, it doesn't have to be uh, a literal uh, description of the painting. This particular poem, I really did, get rather literal, whereas others in the book, I, I went off in other directions. I, I just uh, wanted to point out that um, the they look like they're wearing sunglasses. They're all very protected, uh -huh. safe in this kind of wild beauty, beautiful uh, natural environment. Yes, these yes. Tourists, so, okay. So now you're going to read your poem, which is also called lobsters for lunch. Yes, and, and it's actually also that the, the art was a cover art of, of the book that um, which which is a lot of fun. So the poem actually in the cover kind of wraps around so to get the full thing. Um, but the poem appears sort of three quarters away the the book and it, it it's kind of like the the glue that the other poems spin out of. Oh neat. Huh. Okay, lobster for lunch, 21 by 30 acrylic. After Mexico and before she died, my mother painted a middle-aged couple in tie-dye, seated in a tropical pavilion, confronting a lobster. The lobster spreads its crimson legs toward three papaya and a furry coconut. A pineapple sends up spires, it's a mystery why she gave the lobster such huge claws and the people no hands. Their impassive faces ask, who will slice the fruit? Who will open the shell? The tourists might be my mother and one of the men she almost married. The monkey drowses at the edge, fondling an empty glass and a half peeled banana. He has my mother's nimble fingers. Hmm. So it's almost as if um, the two tourists are completely passive and powerless. <laughs> um, yeah, well, they're they're like postcard images. They're not mm -hmm. they're not quite real. There, there's a sense of artifice about it. Mm -hmm. And the world beyond them is just huge. So th that's portrayed well in the painting because I it's you know this is responding to the, your mom's painting as well. Um, and in the book, the painting is there with your poem so it's like easy it's like they're kind of really connected yeah well th yeah this is the only poem in the book where you actually get to see the painting because oh, okay. it was used on the cover uh as, as the cover art um 
And uh, so readers, if they wish, they could look at the cover and see the painting. But the, the fun thing about ekphrastic art, uh, poetry is that once you have the poem, it's, it's fun and it's fascinating to see the painting, but the poem becomes its own thing um, and tells its own story. So it's not necessary to see the artwork that um, inspired it, although it's always interesting to see that. What I liked was they're confronting a lobster, like the lobster is about, the dead lobster is about to attack them. And, and then the lobster is described as, um, kind of along with three papaya and a furry coconut, like just part of a table setting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and there's, all, there's something remotely um, sexual about it. Um, the, the three papaya and the furry coconut. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you, I had the sense looking at it is it, you have these people here and they're pretending to live, and there, there's a sensuality, but it's not it's not real. Mm -hmm. It's not real. It's not real. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's like, and that's kind of like what tourists do. They pretend that they're part of the landscape, the culture of the place that they might visit, and so mm -hmm. often, and they're just really like, please protect me from this place. It's so strange and different. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, then you, and then you've got the monkey. The monkey is the most real thing in this painting. Mm -hmm. And um, what I love about the monkey is it did seem to be my mother's persona. And mm -hmm. when I say that the monkey has her nimble fingers, um, that's implying that you have my mother almost as a, a godlike figure or, or a trickster more so uh -huh. manipulating the scene. She is making the scene. She is making the whole picture. She's creating this, this reality. Mm -hmm. She's the creator. Right. And it's as if the, I noticed there was a swan with a fish and there's a monkey with a banana and with a glass like that people drink from. So it's like the monkey is negotiating its place in the universe between humanity and, and mm -hmm. Swan, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I also love a pineapple sends up spires. And then on the heels of that, it's a mystery. Just, I mean, you could just stop there almost um, mm -hmm. because the, the curiosity of the, Pineapple sending up spires, I love. Yeah, I looked at this painting for a long, long time. And, you know, it was one, I think she painted it like in the 80s. And it was one that was hanging on the wall and I was younger and I would just walk by it and not really look at it. And I didn't really look at it till after she died. And it is a mystery because, um, there's so many things I wonder about, like, what was she trying to say? What was, what were her relationships like? Mm -hmm. um, what was she trying to achieve? What did she long for? Uh, what did she believe? Um, and because she was painting in symbols, it, it gave me a lot to, to dig into and explore. And it, you know, it's interesting. Um, this style of painting she moved into like during the eighties prior to this, she had been a strict realist mm -hmm. painting in the old masters realism style um, that was preached by, you know, a scholar named Jacques Marge in the forties had promoted a resurgence of old masters realism. Mm -hmm. And Jacques Marge had written a book called Secret Formulas and Techniques of the Masters. And the whole idea was to try to paint, rep to replicate life like a photograph in a painting. Um, so my mother was an ardent believer and student of his for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And then she turned away from it <laughs> and, and went to this primitive uh, raw style that with the freer brush strokes and, and not attempting to be realistic. 
Right. Uh, and so she could have been making a statement about her new approach to art also. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the abandonment of realism. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So much to think about. It's been great talking with you and people can find where to order Jackie's book. And I will, if we don't have it in the library, I will order it for the library. Um, uh, but you can find where to order Jackie's books, I think, right? Um, on her website, JackieCraven.com. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Jackie. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.